It's now time for the Billy C Show. Part of the BillyCBoxing.com network. And we're coming to you live from the Billy C Studios. In Lake George, New York, I'm Bill Calagero, and it's time for the Billy C Show. Good morning, good day, good evening, whenever you're watching, whenever you're listening. I hope you're doing okay today. Today's show is being brought to us in part by my book, Tom Molino, From Bondage to Baddest Man on the Planet, is available right now where all good books are sold. You can get yourself a copy of this book right now while you're watching or listening to this very show. Just visit uh, Amazon.com. Or barnesandnoble.com. Or if you can't find that, just uh, find it there. Just uh, drop me an email, bill at billycboxing.com or billy at talking, T-A-L-K-I-N, boxing, B-O-X-I-N-G, uh, dot com. Um, I, uh, oh, sad note to report. Um, Gary Shaw, a uh, longtime promoter, uh, passed away today. Our uh, condolences uh, go out to the friends and family of Gary Shaw, uh, my man, uh, John from, uh, Don King, uh, promotions, uh, just, uh, filled me in on that. But, um, Hey, uh, coming up on the show, I hate, you know, it's uh, terrible, terrible. Um, uh, coming up on the show today, I got scheduled, uh, uh, John Iceman Scully, uh, former, uh, uh, world title challenger. He's a, uh, Connecticut boxing hall of famer. And in my opinion, uh, one of the uh, uh, top young trainers out there today. And and that's one of my main topics today. Um, we need trainers. We need real trainers. We need teachers. Uh, what I see a lot of is rah-rah men. And uh, we'll be talking to John about that in a few minutes. Um, but uh, I just want to remind you guys that uh, today's show is also being brought to us in part by BillyCBoxing.com. Check it out. Uh, we, uh, we've been posting all the relevant, uh, boxing news and pull it down once it's, uh, no longer, uh, valid or no longer live or no longer, you know, relevant, you know? So, uh, so check that out. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to us, uh, on YouTube and podcast and rumble and now Instagram. I'm just learning that. So, uh, uh, give me, uh, give me some time to, to get on there. But, uh, one fight result I want to, uh, talk about real quick was uh star boxing slug fest at the sun i was ringside at the mohegan sun what an entertaining uh card that was uh the main event uh had uh popeye richie rivera uh he won a uh, 10 round unanimous decision over devon lee um and he improves to 26 wins two losses uh 19 of his wins coming by knockout uh you could read about all the other fights uh, on billycboxing.com uh, there was a uh, pretty entertaining uh, heavyweight uh, fight that was uh, uh, on that card as well. Um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, it was worth the watch. So if you haven't seen it, uh, definitely, uh, uh, definitely check that out. Um, and also uh, uh, Sharif Rahman, uh, who's the son of uh, Haseem Rahman, he was there. Um, he's got a long way to go, but I got a a chance to talk to, uh, Rockman's other son and, uh, we're going to have him on a show coming up and, uh, uh, the two sons seem to be doing uh, better than the father, but, uh, uh, it is what it is. And, uh, there was some other fights on there, uh, as well. Um, but, uh, uh, the heavyweight fight I wanted to talk about is, uh, D-Mac Edmonds, uh, and he fought, uh, Luis Miguel Valera. Um, six round title fight. And, um, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, uh, Edmonds got the nod. He improved to nine and oh with seven knockouts. Um, and, uh, uh, Cuban, uh, I mean, Valera, who is a tough Cuban, he dropped to four wins, three losses, uh, and a couple of draws and a knockout. Um, it was, um, a split decision win. And, to be honest with you, I, I think they gave, uh, uh, you know, Edmonds a gift uh, because uh, uh, he certainly um, uh, he certainly uh, did not uh, overwhelm uh, his opponent. 
uh, but he did have the googly eyed look in uh, in his. <laughs> if you have if you watch the video, you'll see what I mean about the googly eyes. Uh, I want to give a shout out my main uh, coach. Okay, um, he's been a long time uh, not only viewer and listener of this show, but uh, he's also uh, contributed to it quite a bit. As a matter of fact, um, you know he. Uh, uh, does his uh, this day in boxing history a lot and and references us. I, I, I want to thank him, but more more than that, um, he's uh, he's been working with a young kid, and uh, his name is uh, Travis uh, the What's Next Kid Smith. Uh, he's 14 years old. Uh, he's a freshman in uh, uh, William Floyd High School, and he's the younger brother of former WBO uh, light heavyweight champ, Joe the Beast Smith. Um, and uh, this kid uh, just claimed the 2024 uh, Ringmaster Finals in 140-pound division. Uh, he won uh, uh, a unanimous points uh, win uh, last Saturday night in Brooklyn at Gleason's Gym. Uh, I just uh, wanted to give uh, Travis a shout-out and congrats. And I just wanted to also give uh, Travis my condolences uh, that he has to put up with Coach, who, uh, from what I understand, runs this kid through the ring. So congratulations, uh, uh, all kidding aside, to Travis and my man, uh, Coach, for their uh, for their win. Uh, okay, so they announced the uh, Canelo Alvarez and uh, Jaime Mungaya uh, undercard. Um, you know... I it's a pay-per-view, right? It's a, it's a PBC card. And, you know, my man, John is in the chat room right now, uh, works, uh, with Don King, you know, Don King, people don't give him the credit. You know, when he did a big event, it was a big event. Okay. Um, e even when he had to work with, uh, uh, other promoters that he didn't exactly, uh, like, um, you know, they, they would get together and make the big fights. But the one thing you could always count on, on Don King with Don King promotions is when they did a, a big event, whether it be a pay-per-view event or just a, a, a big, bigger event, you were going to get a slew of, uh, especially with the pay-per-views, a slew of, uh, top-notch matchups. And, uh, I, I think that, uh, Canelo and, and, uh, uh, Mugaya, that card has fallen a little short. Um, the co-main event features Mario Barros. Uh, he's 28 and two. He's defending his interim belt. There's a lot of interim belts on this card, guys, uh, against Fabian Madonna, um, who's the uh, younger brother of Marcos Madonna. Uh, Brandon Figueroa, you remember him? He was in that uh, tournament, ESPN's tournament. He's uh, they're they're brushing the dust off of him and they're bringing him back. And he too has a WBC interim belt uh, in the uh, featherweight. Uh, division. I'm sorry, I, I uh, confused him with someone else. It's not the same Figueroa that I was thinking of. Uh, it's another card uh, that Adams is on. Uh, my bad. I, I, I see my man John Scully is ready to come on, so I, he's got me all nervous. You know, when when you're dealing with a guy of of his nature, you know, it, it makes even old men like me a little nervous. Uh, but uh, I'll get back to this because I don't want to take up too much of John's time. And speaking of John. Uh, Scully, he joins us uh, right now. What's up, John? What's up? How you doing? I'm doing good, my man. I appreciate you uh, stopping by and, and joining us. And, and, you know, one of the topics I wanted to uh, mention uh, was trainers today. And, uh, you know, I, I think that boxing has too many rah-rah men, John. Um, I don't think we have enough uh, teachers uh, as far as uh, trainers go. What's your thoughts on a comment like that? Uh what I think, what I do know, and I saw it literally just last night, somebody sent me a video, and you have these coaches who are trying to become famous. They're, they're trying to be a part of the show, right? Now, nowadays with social media, everybody wants to be a part of the show. So you have these trainers, and their whole focus is doing flashy pad work that that does not translate. I don't care what anyone in Floyd Mayweather's camp says. That does not translate to a real fight. If you taught people to train like that from their first day in the gym, they would never win a fight. They would get annihilated. Um, it's not real pad work, but they do it because they get so much attention on the Internet. And I saw one yesterday, literally yesterday, 
where the trainer, it was a woman trainer, and she's doing the pads and she's doing it really fast and she's making noise. But then when the uh, when the video when the round ended, she looked at the camera. She looked directly in the face, you know, like, oh, did you see what I did? And that that's that's probably the the indication uh, of what it's like in boxing today. That's who we're dealing with. And uh, I'm not a fan of it at all. No. I, and, you know, it's funny you say that because uh, I, I was with uh, an old friend of mine. He, he's a trainer as well, Dave Wojcicki. Uh, this past weekend, we, we were at uh, Mohegan Sun uh, at the fights together. And we were talking about exactly that, about the, the, the pads and stuff. And, um, you know, again, uh, we, we brought up Floyd as well, you know, because he was famous for doing the blindfolded pad. And basically, every, that's choreographed. And, and we were talking about it. It's good you know, uh, as a timing mechanism or, or at least, a, you know, here's an opening type of a thing. But if, if a fighter is just learning how to hit the mitt when it's at a certain spot, he's not really learning when that spot is open with a fighter, right? I mean, I mean, the whole idea it, initially when it came out was to try to help a fighter identify openings and then be able to move, you know, get the punch to that spot. But now it's become more of a show, like you say. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like I say, it, it, we, social media is ruining boxing to a certain degree because, you know, you have these guys and they, they know like literally they're, they're addicted to the, um, uh, you know, the fame and the, you know, the likes and the comments and, uh, you know, so they're doing the stuff that goes away from what really boxing is. They're going, they're more, they're gearing it more towards what would the average person on Instagram find interesting. Uh, and, you know, so they're, they're killing it because there's the kids growing up in the game who think this is the way it's supposed to be. They think that's how you're supposed to punch. That's how you're supposed to move. And, uh, you know, it can't, it can't be a good thing going forward. It cannot be good. No, and it's the same thing that is my big argument. I got my man Coach in the chat room. He's, he's, he put up this quote. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, John. Uh, the quote says, the wait in the dressing room before a professional boxing match, that's the last hour could be enough to strip a man who never boxed before of whatever pride, desire, heart he thought he had. Did you ever hear that before, John? Nah, doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that don't know, that's an that's a Iceman Scully quote. But... Uh, Thanks for that, coach. But, you know, it's the same thing, John, with the with the O's, you know, I, I mean, young fighters today and, and the fans to, to a degree, they equate a, a talented fighter if they're undefeated. And it drives right. me insane, man, because right. that's not the case. And you see all these mismatches and a lot of the younger fans are happy to see, you know, the fighter that they call their favorite fighter annihilate a guy that really shouldn't be in the same ring with them. Right. Well, you know. I believe this this started probably in the early 1980s when the fights were on network TV every week, every weekend. And so they had to sell the fights. Like if you remember back in those days, and they were good fighters, but remember uh, Robin Blake, Melvin Paul, you know, Dangerous Don Lee, all those guys. It was like there's a hundred of them, James Schuler, uh, you know, a million of them, and they were all undefeated. So the average person said, wow, this guy's 22 and 0, and he's fighting a guy 19 and 0. We got to watch this fight. And they were good fighters, but once they lost, people were like, oh, he's not that good. It's like he's 22 and 1. He only lost one fight, and you're saying he's not that good. Where everybody in the game knows, every fighter knows, every fighter has been in the ring with a guy who had 15 losses, who was a beast, who they couldn't believe had. 15 guys were able to beat this man. Uh, so that's the reality of it. You know, you, you, if you went right now to a guy who never watched boxing, but he's a sports fan, he likes football, right? And you tell him, you say, who's better? A guy that's 22 and 0 with 19 knockouts or a guy that's 17 and 3 with 10 knockouts? Well, obviously, automatically, instantly, he's going to say the undefeated guy, not knowing who they are not knowing that one of them is Emmanuel Augustus, you know what I mean? So right. 
it's misleading 100 percent oh everything in boxing marketing is misleading i you know i i kind of thought it it took a turn a little later than that john and one, one of the people that i feel were, was responsible for that was floyd mayweather because he started you know bragging about his O, oh, and then the promoters and followed by the networks they started thinking they couldn't sell a fight unless the fighter was undefeated. You know what I right. mean? Yeah, and, yeah, you know, sure. so, but, but those fights, like you mentioned that we got to watch on, on Saturday afternoons and stuff every weekend, they were great fights. And, and, you know, even back in the day before that in, in the fifties and early sixties, you know, you know, a fighter would fight the same guy three times, you know, right. and one right. would win right. one, one would win another, you know, and, and all of that, were, you know, the fans are, they're missing out on that. And uh, anyway, I know I know your time is 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 tight, but um, all right. Let talk about training. Right. I, I think you're one of the hottest uh, young trainers out there today. And um, in the last fight, uh, you had uh, Steve bang, bang, uh, Butler bang, banged his opponent in the first round. I loved it. But but this is what I loved even more, John, because. Not only have you said to me in the past, but I've heard you tell fighters, you know, when mics are on uh, them, uh, on you guys in the corner that, you know, I don't care what I've heard you say. And I'll, I'll you know, paraphrase a bit. I don't care what the crowd is, is doing. You know, you keep boxing. Don't worry about the knockout. And, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Your job is is to make sure your fighter is safe and that he comes out of the fight with a win. What happened with 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 Bang Bang? Did he just have the opportunity and took advantage of it? I mean, were you training for a knockout? Because to me, uh, that was never your MO. Right. Well, what, what happened was, uh, you know, Steven is that type of guy. He's His innate nature is to attack and kill. Like, he's, he's just that type of person outside of the ring. He's even like that, you know, mentally. But what happened was we watched some films and uh, we, we saw something uh, – as far as the, the, the right hand that, that we could get it in before, before uh, Steve Rolls could counter. That was what we worked on. And uh, I had no idea it was going to happen so quickly, but um, it was kind of a thing where it just happened. Like, like, I don't know if he tried to do it, but we definitely worked on that specific punch and that specific positioning. Right. Uh, and, you know, it just it just happened out of out of nowhere. Uh, I was I was I was probably more shocked than Steve Rolls was. Yeah, well, you know that's another uh, another statement you hear all the time. You know, don't look for the knockout. If it comes, it comes. You know, and uh, and there was a perfect case. Um, you work with uh, uh, another <laughs> top fighter, Artur Beterbiev, and and how do you pronounce his last name? I've heard it pronounced Beter Bev and Beter Beef. What what's the correct? I, I say better buyer. Better buy of okay. And, and um, he's never corrected me. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, he, who knows? He probably doesn't really care what they call him, you know. But uh, as long as they're holding his hand up at the end, big fight coming up against uh, Bivol. Uh, it's a fight that the fans want to see. It's a fight that boxing needs. I I credit both of these guys for for actually having the balls to fight each other because it seems that you know in today's boxing that the two best fighters in, in a division generally you know avoid each other um so so what's your thoughts and obviously you're you're you know uh, with a tour and everything but is there anything i mean B bivol is a is a talented boxer is yeah. is a tour going to change his style at all to to do that or is he going to just go to work the way he always goes to work i would say he's going to do what he does what he normally does uh he wouldn't he wouldn't need to change very much um you know, his jab, obviously his jab is, is world class, beautiful jab. Um, his boxing IQ, his acumen is is high, high level. Um, you know, people people in, instinctively would think Bavol is the better boxer, right? And maybe visually he is, but if you're gonna talk about science of boxing and ring generalship and, and, and that type of thing. He's not better than Arthur. Now, Arthur's, Arthur's right there as good as anyone on earth with his boxing skills. Um, you know, he just has the tremendous power and strength that, uh, you know, that goes, goes without saying. Um, I, think, I think the fight's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, ultimately, I would, I would think 
Arthur's strength and pressure is 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 going to prevail. Um, I I'm a you know I'm a fan of Bavol. I think he's very very good. But when I get ready for a fight like this, I always keep in mind one thing, and that is whether they realize it or not. Everyone's you know, they're so high on him, right? Instinctively, they're very high. You mention his name, you go, oh, that guy's good. That guy's really good. But they're basing it, whether they realize it or not, on him beating Canelo. And Canelo, let's, it is what it is. He's a very, very small super middleweight, let alone light hair. He's a very small man. And Bavol was supposed to beat him. You know, people may not agree with that. They may not realize that. But Bavol was supposed to beat him. Canelo is a very small guy. He doesn't belong at light heavyweight. The one time, you know, he, he stopped Kovalev, people forget the weight clause Canelo put on Kovalev in that fight where Kovalev couldn't gain any weight back after the weigh-in. So he went into the fight as a dead man. It was a it was a pre-gone cl- conclusion that he was going to fade later in the fight and get, get broken down. Um so, you know, I think Arthur has a huge advantage in, in obviously in strength and punching power, but also in the fact that people don't realize what an excellent boxer and a smart boxer he really is. And, uh, and I think Bavol, Bavol probably knows that, but he's going to find out firsthand. Yeah, Arthur showed that in his last fight, um, a, a little more uh, uh, boxing skill than people were used to because he just seemed to be blowing people out. When when you talk about Bivol, um, you know uh, he hasn't he hasn't knocked people out uh, of late. Is, is that something that you guys are keeping in the back of your mind as you prepare for this fight? Like, it, it, does Arthur think that he's not going to be able to hurt him, or uh, do you just think? like we said earlier that the knockouts just haven't come, but he's still got the pop to do it. Right. Everybody, you know, I've fought guys and somebody who didn't fight said, yeah, he can't punch. Oh, good, good. He can't punch. And then I get in and I remember many times specifically getting hit. And my first thought is that guy didn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> like this, guy, <laughs> this guy hits way harder than the guy who never got hit by him before thinks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I'll tell I'll say this: Arthur is the consummate professional, and this is what I really think is one of the keys to his success. Arthur goes into every fight not planning on winning by knockout. He doesn't believe it or not. He doesn't go in thinking that. He goes in to work on technique and skills. He wants to outbox you, and he's proven that every time. He just it's just that when he catches the guy's flush, that's what happens. But he's he's not thinking knockout at all. He's trying to win, win because he knows if the fight goes to a decision, he has to have done enough to actually win, and that's that's him, one hundred percent. Have you noticed Father Time catching up to him yet, or what? Well, I'll say I'll say this: as soon as his fight was over, the last fight with Callum, uh, as soon as the fight was over, I thought this, and and I talked to Arthur, you know, a little while, and this is what I told him. I said, that's the best you've ever looked. You're 38 years old. That was the you've been improving over the last five years. I think he's gotten better, but that was the best performance of his career. So, no, I don't think you know. I think, I think people fade because they're human and they they eat junk food and they party and maybe they smoke weed and they're not dedicated like they should and everything. Arthur is on a different level. And he's showing that you can be a supreme athlete later on. You can be heading towards your 40s and still be good. Uh, and I think Bernard Hopkins was probably the first one who really showed that. And, you know, uh, Arthur is, is, is following that same type of path. You know, it's, it's funny you say that because I always say, you know, and I, and I used to, you know, be the, the old time uh, fighters, you know, the, the fighters of yesteryear. And I'm talking, you know, when people talk to me now, oh, you mean back in the day, they're talking about the 80s. You know, I'm talking about that way before that. Um, but with the advancements we've had in nutrition and workout techniques and stuff, it, you know, athletic wise, I would think that we actually could have the best boxers ever. Um, but the one piece that I see missing, John, and, and you're in the trenches, you, you, you would know more than me is the mental aspect, because I think that today's society 
forget boxers, just everybody is mentally weak. And I yeah, yeah, I yeah. see it transcending into the sport, John. Do you? Yeah, 100%. 100%. And listen, I'll tell you this much. And I'm a big proponent of this. You know, people talk about the strength. Of everybody, I've had fighters ask me the first question out of their mouth. All right, who's my strength coach going to be? I said, man, I'm your strength coach. You know, I'm, I'm getting you ready for boxing. Uh, people today have a strength coach. And the guy monitors their heart rate and their pulse. And he keeps track of the enzymes that he takes into his body and all this kind of stuff. And they still, in 12 rounds, only throw 700 punches. Meanwhile, back when they didn't have strength coaches, Yaki Lopez and Bobby Chacon and Cornelius Boza Edwards and Ray Mancini and Aaron Pryor were throwing 7,000 punches around and, and, and recovering quickly because they had the mentality and they trained like the fighters train. I don't, I'm one of the guys who I don't think that we are better conditioned today because if you look at the punch stat numbers, 30 years ago and today they're not you know because if if it was so much better today guys would be breaking records ray Oliveira didn't have a strength coach and he was just a scrappy kid and he was throwing 1500 punches a fight he did it like three or four times i think in one fight i think it was him and vince phillips they combined think about this they combined for over 3,000 punches in a fight Think about that. 3,000 punches. That's and they didn't have strength coach and all this kind of stuff going on. Um, show me a guy today who throws that many punches. Devin Haney doesn't throw that many punches. Shakur Stevenson does, certainly doesn't throw that many punches. So yeah. what good is a strength coach if you can't throw 100 punches around and can't be strong later in the fight and scoring? Look at all the guys back in the day who scored knockouts in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th round. You don't you you don't see many late round knockouts today. That's because the guys aren't strong later on in the fight. You know, I, I, maybe I'm crazy, but I think, and I started seeing when I was working with fighters and stuff uh, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. I started noticing that fighters would run to the treadmill or the or the bike and and claim that that's their road work. And I used yeah. to always say, no, road work is road work, and yeah. and it's different than a treadmill, even yeah. when, if a treadmill is being elevated, do you think that that has something to do with it, that they're not out running the way, you know, the old time fighters used to run? Right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. I know what it is. When you physically, if you run on a treadmill and set the bar high, you know, the elevation is, it would be physically as good as running on the road. Right. Physically, it would be, it'd be, it'd be this, you know, your body doesn't know that that it's concrete and, and plastic. Right. But the mentality of it, there's something to be said for getting out there in the cold weather and putting a winter hat on and gloves and putting a scarf on so the wind doesn't go down your jacket. And you have to run in that and you have to dig down and run through the mud and the, and the rain and the, all in the snow and on a beach and that type of thing. That's where the mentality gets built up. Building your mentality on a treadmill is almost impossible because there are no elements that you have to deal with other than the physicality of running five miles. When you run five miles outside, you have to run five miles, but you have to go up a hill at some point. You got to run over some rocks and you got to jump over some logs that are in the path. You know, it's different. It's absolutely different. That's why I would say, Sometimes a guy will tell me, yeah, I'll, um, I'm not going to come to the gym today. I'll work out at my house. I go, no. Working out at your house and working out in the gym is two different things. Even if you do the same exact thing. There's something about being in the element of a boxing gym and smelling that sweat and dirt and, you know, spit on the ground and all that kind of stuff. It's different. You have to be in the element to build your mind. When you train, you're not just training your body. You're training your mind. And being in a real boxing gym is a thousand times more important than being in your garage. No, I agree. And and it's funny you said that about running outside, uh, jumping over rocks, uh, you know, avoiding a stick, a rut or something like that. See, now, I thought that that also helped 
with uh, agility and 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 movement of a fighter when they're in the ring. They they learn to yeah. adjust real quick, you know. And and that was another thing I thought road work would would help a fighter. Whereas like a treadmill or a stationary bike, uh, you know, you're not right. doing nothing, you know. So. I, I, I tell you a funny thing, and this is on video. There's a video on YouTube of me, uh, the pre-fight when I fought. Graziano Rachigani in Berlin, Germany. And they showed me running through a park in Berlin. And all of a sudden you see me stop and I, I move to the side and I'm, I'm standing upright and I look funny. And uh, it was a Doberman Pinscher had showed up. <laughs> and, 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 and in my mind, I say, good, I'm glad he showed up because that's like in the middle of a round, something happens completely unexpected and you have to deal with it. Whereas on a treadmill, you know, for the if you set the clock for 30 minutes, in the next 30 minutes, nothing different is going to happen than what is happening right now. You know this. And you can run on the treadmill with the idea that you know nothing is going to come, ha- come and happen to you. Whereas in a boxing match and running on a mountain, something is going to come out of the woodwork that's unexpected. And that's what you have to prepare for. Um. Uh, one more training thing I, I wanted to ask, and I, and I got uh, one other thing I want to ask you, and I, and I know you got to go, but um, all right. So, I, I, you know, I think you're one of, uh, you know, the best uh, young trainers out there. I, I also am pretty high on on Buddy McGirt. Um, what can some of these, I, I call them rah-rah men, okay? There's no, as far as I know, unless it's changed, there's no, um training that a trainer has to to go through uh to get a license to be a chief second or or even just a corner man you know you got your money your your 30 50 bucks whatever it is and poof you're a trainer and that's what i think the problem is do you think it would be advantageous for the sport to in order to be a corner person or or at least a head trainer that they undergo some training so that these guys are are actually teaching the fight or something or, yeah, or listen, listen, let me, I will give you the story of stories. It'll only take 30 seconds. This will, this will illustrate where we are at. Okay. I go to a fight one time. I think it was at Foxwoods. I bring my friend with me. He doesn't box. He's not a box. He likes boxing, but he's not a boxer. I bring my friend with me. He gets there. He sees that the tickets are like $50, the cheapest ticket. He's like, man, 50 bucks. I said, listen, come with me. Oh, no. We'll say say you're a trainer. You'll pay $25 for your license, and you'll you'll get in. He's like, what? I go, yeah. And we went in. He filled out the license for the trainer application. He paid his $25. Boom. He's in the room with me. He's in the dressing room with me. <laughs> right. Never been a boxer, never been a trainer in his life. <laughs> but he but he put his address and his name and $25 on the application, and he became a trainer. So technically, officially, that man is a boxing trainer. He's a licensed professional boxing trainer. He couldn't teach you how to – he couldn't teach a dog how to bark. <laughs> but – this man is a trainer. It's just, it's just sad. And, and I think that, that that's half the problem. I, I watch these guys, you know, and the other thing I always enjoy is, you know, the mic and the cameras on, on the, the, the team, right? You got your, your, your couple of trainers in the fighter and you hear the, the guy going, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. When, when we get in the ring, we're going to do this and we're going to do yeah. that. Then the fighter loses. Now the camera and the mic's in front of the guy. He just, he just couldn't execute. The guy, yeah, he <laughs> just, the guy he also in the trade is like, he didn't do this. He didn't yeah. do that. Hey, look, here's, here's my favorite. This is my favorite. When you're in the ring before the fight and the fighter has a couple of his friends, usually they're a big guy, you know, they look tough. They look mean. They look like they just got out of prison sometimes. And they're over there on the other side of the ring looking at, the fighter in my corner, like, like they're, they're, they're about to fight him and they're giving him the evil eye and the mean look. And I'm saying to myself, what are you doing? Like, who are you? You, you know, and I know, and everybody knows that when 
in 30 seconds, you're going to get out of the ring and go sit in the audience next to the other fans. But you're in here trying to intimidate Arthur Betabayev or Bernard Hopkins. I mean, you're going to get your man killed, right? You're going to be in there portraying the role of the tough guy, knowing you're going to not have to interact at all physically, and you're going to leave your friend over there. My, I'd be If it was me and I'm fighting Roy Jones and my friend is next to me, Taunting Roy, I'm be like, hey man, <laughs> don't give this dude any matter, and he has to be <laughs> right. Yeah, so we have those guys in the game, and they're and they're everywhere, and they always wear sunglasses too at nighttime, in the summer, you know, in the winter in Vegas, and they're inside at eleven at night on TV, and they need the sunglasses. So no, I, that I, tells I love, you, I love that tells too. you where we're at. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Hey, I got uh, somebody in the. Uh, chat room asking to ask you a question wants to know how much credit you think a coach should get Here, here's the reality like like a trainer trains you and there's things you're going to do in the fight innately automatically without even noticing it that that the trainer showed you so he gets credit for that but you're the fighter you're executing you know you've got to dig down right and uh i'll give it I'll give an example to, to, to show you what I'm talking about. When Chad Dawson fought Bernard Hopkins, we had planned to box early on in the fight. And you know, I figured Chad's tall and he's got amazing boxing skills and reflexes and Bernard's a little older and, you know, that's going to be the move. So we do that in the beginning of the, the fight, the first three or four rounds, and Chad's boxing and Chad's winning. In my eyes, he was winning. About the fourth round or so, though, I saw a little something. It wasn't really noticeable, but I noticed it. I noticed Bernard starting to cut cut the distance down a little bit. His reaction was getting a little better. Bernard was starting to find the timing. He hadn't found it yet, but he was starting to. So I took a chance, and I said to Chad, I said, listen, everything we worked on, forget it. I said, change your whole strategy. I want you to go right to him. Once you put your hands up, I want you to bully him. I want you to go right to him. He's not going to expect it. It's going to throw everything off because he's starting to time you. He's starting to figure something out. And from that point on, we won, I think, pretty clearly, right? So in my mind, I can say I contributed greatly. However, I had Chad Dawson who had the physicality and the ability and the skills to do that. I could have told 20 other guys to do that and I would have been right, but they wouldn't have been able to do it. So you can give me credit for seeing it, but you have to give credit, Chad, credit, excuse me, credit to Chad for doing it and having the skills to do it and having the ability to do it, you know? So uh, the fighter plays the huge role and he has to be able to execute, but you got to give the trainer some credit if he's, if he's giving him the good advice, he's guiding the ship a little bit. Uh, so everybody gets their part. But, you know, some guys wouldn't have been able to do what Chad did. So he gets well, the credit because he's Chad Dawson. Well, you know, sometimes the fighter, especially if they're getting tired or they get hurt, they go back to even even if a, a trainer and a fighter worked on a different game plan and, and you know, introduced yeah. some different strategies, when they get tired or specifically when they get hurt, they automatically go back to what they're most comfortable yeah. with. Yeah, you know? for sure. And for so, sure. So, so the better fighters w would have more control over not doing that. You would think, you know, the more right. disciplined guys, but, uh, right. But well, anyway, and then like I say, you have to trust your trainer because he's telling you something, right. And you may not see it. And you, you, you know, if you say, oh, I'm not going to do that, I don't feel comfortable doing that. You know, but you got to trust the guy because he sees so he sees better than you. The trainer has a better view than the fighter does. Absolutely. Uh, like I say, in that particular case, I saw that that Bernard was starting to time things a little. And maybe maybe Chad didn't see it. Maybe he did. But uh, but he probably wouldn't have changed the game plan in that manner uh, as a result. So so we're a team. You know, the trainer and the fighter are a team. And you have to trust the trainer. And if you don't trust the trainer to go with what he says, even though you, you may not think so at the time, it's probably not a good situation. You have to trust the trainer hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Then you get to say we, 
Right. We right, did. Right. We trained. We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we didn't take the punches, though. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, geez, that punch didn't hurt one bit. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, right. it didn't hurt you. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. John, one last question before uh, we let you go, and I really appreciate you uh, uh, taking some time with us today. Um, you mentioned Canelo. Canelo Alvarez is uh, taking on uh, Jaime Mungaya in, in his next fight. A lot. Everybody wanted to see Benavidez, of course. I, I actually... Uh, would love to see uh, Terrence Crawford fight him, um, but that's a whole other story. In my opinion, the old saying, styles make fights, and I think that uh, Canelo's the kind of guy that likes to be in your wheelhouse, uh, work the body, and and break you down. Um, and and, and Mugai is this, the same way, you know, and uh, he's younger. I, I think Canelo's in for a tougher fight than a lot of people do, What's your thoughts on that matchup? Yeah, you know, it's the kind of thing where I think instinctively, reactively, people, if they're not super familiar with you, they assume you're not that good. Or they assume you couldn't, you know, like like there's probably a guy in Australia somewhere right now or England or wherever that we never heard of who, if he did fight Canelo, would give Canelo the fight of his life, right? People would be shocked because they never heard of the guy before. Right? Munguia, he's not a big, big, I wouldn't say he's a star, a superstar. He's not a big, giant name, but he's good. The guy's good. He can fight. Um, you know, I, if I had to choose, I would, I would pick Canelo. Uh, but yeah, I don't think Canelo's just going to toy with this kid. You know, this guy, this guy's for real. And, uh, you know, just like with Bavol, I remember people thinking Bavol was going to be ridiculously easy fight for Canelo and that. They thought he was just picking the safest option at light heavyweight, you know, as opposed to going after Arthur. Look at the shock they got. You know, they uh, they 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 chose that. You know, make no mistake, Canelo chooses. He's in a position where, like Sugar Ray Leonard was at for a time, where he can choose. And Canelo's choosing, and obviously he chose the wrong guy. It's not like he thought he was going to beat was wasn't going to beat Bavol. You know what I mean? He didn't say, "I think this guy might beat me, so let me fight him." He chose him for a reason. He chose Munguia for a reason. But I think Munguia is young enough and strong enough and and has the attitude enough to make this a very good fight. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing is, is with, with Bivol, um, you know, he, he, I mean, in my opinion, he had better boxing skill than, than Canelo. Uh, Munguia does not. but he, And he doesn't. He's not fast. He, he doesn't really have great footwork. He's got no defense, but he's got a solid chin. I, that's why I have a feeling that they're going to be in there banging. And, you know, at this stage of, of Jaime's career, it's going to all boil down to if Canelo runs out of gas. Because if he runs out of gas, he's going to find himself getting popped pretty hard, I think. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, if he can box him. It should be a, a, a good, you know, good night for Canelo. But I'm just not yeah. sure that he does that anymore, you know. You know, I was ringside for the Kovalev fight. And, uh, you know, he broke Kovalev down. You know, I mean, you bring out a, a, a great point about the, the uh, rehydration thing and the weight gain uh, but because he definitely broke him down. And, and I never saw Kovalev uh, crumble like that. I mean, I knew he didn't like to get hit in the body, but I, I was not expecting an overwhelming win like that that night. Um, so, Hey, you never know. That's why they fight the fights, right? That's right. That's right. Well, John, listen, I appreciate you joining us and, uh, hopefully, uh, we can have you back again soon. Whenever you got some time, you just let me know. We'll make it happen. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. All right, brother. Take care. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. That's my man, uh, John Iceman Scully, former world light heavyweight title challenger. He's a Connecticut boxing hall of famer. Jeez. He's even, he's even a Billy C boxing hall of famer. Yes. We started, uh, uh, Billy C. Boxing Hall of Fame, and uh, John uh, uh, was uh, one of our inductees, uh, one of the hottest uh, uh, young trainers out there today. So for any fighters that uh, are looking for a quality trainer, uh, give my man John a call. Uh, before we picked up John, we were talking about uh, Canelo and Mungaya's uh, uh, undercard uh, and the co-main event, uh, Mario Barros. Uh, he's taken uh, on uh, Fabian Maidana. Uh, and also uh, Brandon Figueroa uh, is uh, uh, taking on Jesse Magladeno. Uh, and the uh, first fight of the pay-per-view card will be uh, 
uh, Imiantis uh, Stan Stanonasis uh, uh, taking on uh, Gabriel uh, Mastry uh, in that fight. Uh, my thoughts on that card, <laughs> you know, for a pay-per-view, uh, I mean, you know, these are all retread fighters. This is the typical PBC. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's terrible. You know, I think it's a terrible card. I, I mean, I like the main event, you know, uh, but these, I mean, and don't get me wrong. I like Barrios, you know, I just don't think that they're in, uh, you know, I, I just don't think, um, that they're in, uh, uh, tough, uh, but we'll see. Um, a pretty good fight that's taken place May 18th. And this is something, this is why I love the UK, right? but this isn't the UK. Normally, uh, England, you know, they're not afraid to put young fighters against other young up and coming fighters. Um, and the guy that loses it, his career is not over, but this fight's taking place in, uh, uh, California and Richard Torres, uh, he's nine and oh with nine knockouts. He's an Olympic silver medalist. Um, he's taken on Brandon Moore, who's also undefeated 14 and Oh, with eight knockouts. Um, I love this fight. I love this fight. I, I, you know, I, I love it because it puts two uh, undefeated rising heavyweights against each other. And that's what the sport needs. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I, for one, am looking forward to that fight on uh, May 18th. Some other uh, news, uh, Tyson Fury had a press conference and he's always uh, pretty funny. Uh, he held this yesterday, talking about the Usyk fight, and so far it's still on. Uh, he said uh, his so he's in great shape, by the way. Everything is uh, being reported that he, he looks fantastic. Um, he said that his size uh, will be a decisive advantage, and he said, and I quote, he couldn't do, uh, he's referring to Usyk, he says he couldn't do anything with Derek Chisora. We all saw the fight. It was a 50-50 fight. Uh, Could have gone either way. So not unless he's come uh, come on at 38 or 39 years old the last couple of years, like leaps and bounds. I guess he forgot his own performance against Naganu, uh, which was a 50-50 fight. Um, with, uh, I loved his comment when they were saying that, uh, you know, rumor has it Vladimir Klitschko has been helping Yusik, uh prepare for Tyson Fury. <laughs> Tyson Fury says, how could my old man, my old pal Vlad, give anybody advice? Because he would have had to use it himself if he had any advice on how to beat me. I, I love that. Um, I was talking about the two young heavyweights in. Uh, 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 right, that's that's the uh, the other figure over I was uh, uh, thinking about. Um, I apologize for making a mistake. Uh, Rick straightened me out there um, in the chat room. Uh, Fabio Wardley and Frazier Clark, that was that heavyweight fight that took place. What an exciting fight. Two young fighters. Uh, Wardley uh, got the win. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a draw. 17-0-1 now. And Frazier Clark, 18, uh, eight wins, zero losses, and a, and a draw. Um, you know, the promoter's trying to make a rematch. Everybody else wants to make a rematch. Uh, but Wardley says, I'm always looking for the big fights, the big opponents, the big occasions. I want to be part of big events, so there's no steps back for me. Uh, it's always moving forward. He said, but I'm still undefeated. I still got all my belts. I'm in a prime position in terms of sanctioning bodies and the ranking, so there's still plenty of options for me on the table. There are massive amounts of money uh, to be made, and for me to learn more from that Clark. There's a, a massive amounts of money for me to, make, to be made, and I've learned a lot from the Clark fight. It was the first time I had to deal with a massive cut. It was the first time I had to go 12 rounds. Knowing I've been able to do that, now moving forward, I have that faith and the self-belief. Uh, I still had a lot in the tank, so it gives me good confidence to go through it all again. What does all of that mean? I think he's looking for the do-re-me. That's what I think. Um, um, Oscar De La Hoya. Uh, is, somebody asked me uh, on... Uh, on social media, if I knew which promoter was going to be doing the uh, uh, International Boxing Hall of Fame weekend, well, it was announced the two days after I was asked that uh, Oscar De La Hoya, Golden Boy, uh, is going to be the promoter, and uh, the main event's going to be Oscar Colazzo against uh, Gerardo uh, Zapata. 
uh, and that brought, would be broadcast on uh, uh, on the zone. Uh, speaking of the zone and uh, Eddie Hearn, well, every time I think of the zone, I think of Eddie Hearn. He just signed uh, Boots Innes, a multi uh, fight deal. Uh, Innes is 31 and 0 with 28 knockouts. Uh, apparently, he was one of uh, uh, the highest sought after uh, fighters for promoters. And uh, uh, Eddie Hearn uh, got him with Matchroom. And, and uh, you know, there's more reasons why I like it. Um, you know, Eddie Hearn, his fighters fight. What I mean by that is they're not afraid to fight the fights that the fans want. Um, I think he's one of these promoters that's great for the sport. And, uh, you know, now that Boots is with him, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to see some more um, fights between the American fighters and, and the Brits because uh, the British fighters are, are busier. Uh, they have bigger fans. Uh, the fans are, are more boxing knowledgeable. Traditionally, um, they fall short against the U.S. fighters, but uh, I think they're catching up. So we'll see. We'll see what uh, uh, what's going to happen with that. Uh, you know, you guys have uh, heard me talk about um, Terrence Crawford and and Canelo, and uh, you know how we uh, um, we think of of that matchup. Um, you know, I, I, I for one uh, wanted Canelo to fight. Uh, Crawford and I have predicted and still feel the same way that I believe uh, uh, Crawford would win, but I'm not the only one because uh, Brian McIntyre, Bo Mac, uh, who is uh, TC's uh, trainer, uh, well, he was uh, uh, talking about that the other day uh, when he was uh, talking about uh, Canelo and Crawford. He said that's probably what uh, Crawford wants. He wants Canelo, but Bud beats his ass. He outboxes him. The weight doesn't matter. Bud's been fighting um, bigger people all his life. We know how to roll with punches. We know how to take your power. We could take your power away from you. How do you take the power away from a puncher? Timing. It would be just like Errol Spence Crawford, too. He says, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on Canelo's comment that he has no interest in the fight because he's so much bigger. Bomax said, I respect that because you get beat by the smaller guy. The real boxing fans know Bud can beat Canelo. He might be bigger, but he doesn't got he don't have the height, he don't have the reach. He's got uh, a good boxing IQ, but he doesn't have uh the IQ that uh, TC has. And you know, that's why I predicted that TC would win. I, I think he would be able to hit Canelo and get out of harm's way. But um um you know, um you know, I, I, I'm being asked in the chat room here by Jesus, you know, why are people refuse to fight Crawford? Because they're afraid of him. Um, I mean, look, all these fighters, all they want to do is protect their O. And, you know, Crawford's at this point right now where, you know, he's no spring chicken anymore. You know, so the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, he should uh, uh, be trying to get a fight. But I think it's Crawford that's trying to look for a cash out big money fight. And uh, Canelo would definitely uh, give him that. But like uh, Boots, you know, everybody's saying, oh, he's got to fight Boots. Oh, he's got to fight this one. He's got to fight. No, he don't have to fight anybody because he's proven it all. You know, and to be honest with you, uh, I think that he uh, uh, I think that he deserves a big pay payday. And, you know, hey, Zeus, I'm not so sure they would get more money. You know, uh, yeah, Crawford, I, I mean, for, you got to remember, you got to have a dance partner in terms of a promotional outfit, somebody that's willing to cough up the money. Uh, Crawford was with Top Rank for a long time, no disrespect to Bob Aaron, but they never paid him uh, what he's worth now. But now he, the cat's out of the bag. Everybody knows how good Crawford is, so none of these guys are going to want to uh, really fight him. Um, but uh, anyway... I want to break down uh, the fights that are uh, two fights that are coming on this weekend. Um, and I'm, and uh, uh, there are two decent fights that I'm going to take a, a look at. Um, Jordan Gill is taking on Zelfa Barrett. And uh, Gill, um, you know, he's, uh, and this is in the uh, Super Featherweight division. Um, Gill, Jordan Gill's got a record of uh, 28 wins uh, with only two losses. And uh, he was, uh, well, of his uh, 28 wins, he's got nine by knockout. Um, in his two losses, he was stopped both times. He got knocked out by uh, Kiko Martinez in 2022. 
and uh, uh, Mauricio uh, Tanako uh, stopped him in 2019. Uh, his biggest mm -hmm. fights, um, you know, uh, that that he's had um, I, of his 28 wins, um, I, I, I'll tell you three. You know, he beat Michael Conlon uh, last year in December, uh, stopped him in seven. Uh, he beat uh, Kareem uh, Gouffier, um in uh, in 2022. Um, he stopped him in nine. And Cesar Juarez, he beat in 2021, won a 10 round uh, decision. Aside from that, he really doesn't have anybody that uh, sticks out at you. He's 29 years old. He's an orthodox fighter, five foot seven, same height as his opponent. Uh, one thing I want to point out: uh, he's a good boxer. Uh, he's uh, the computer has him ranked at number 46. The WBA has him ranked at number eight. Uh, he's not rated in any of the other three sanctioning bodies, WBC, IBF, or, or WBO. But if you look at this guy's resume, in his pro debut uh, back in 2012, he fought Christian Late. Christian Late, in his pro debut, four-round fight, Late had a record of six wins, 125 losses and six draws. Now, this is this is what I like about England. Now, you would say, oh, this guy is garbage, right? But he went the distance with Gil. And that's what his job is, is to go the distance. He's not like he's been blown out. And, and his uh, fourth fight, he fought a guy, Sid Razik, who was eight wins and 100 losses, went six rounds. I think, look, you could look at it two ways. I think that when you look at these uh, fighters from, from overseas that are professional opponents, because let's face it, that's what a guy, um, you know, with a, with a uh, uh, hundred losses or more. Um, but it, it, it's different if they're getting knocked out and blown away and, you know, they're just a human punching bag. These are guys that go the distance. And his opponent, uh, Zelfer Barrett, you know, also uh, out of the UK, he faced similar opposition. In his uh, first pro fight, his pro debut, he, he too fought Christian Light um, and, and won a four-round decision. He fought him twice, actually, two four-round fights, and he also fought Ibra Reyes, uh, who had uh, four wins and only 78 losses. And by the time Christian Light fought uh, Barrett the second time he had 205 losses. So, uh, he, uh, you know, obviously, a, a, a professional, uh, opponent. Anyway, Gill steps in with Zelfa Barrett. Zelfa Barrett's got 30 wins, uh, 16 coming by knockout. He's got two losses. Um, he was stopped in November of 22. Uh, Rakimov stopped him and then he lost to, uh, Rondis Clark, a majority 12 round decision. In 2018, he's the same height uh, as Gill. Um, he's more of a, uh, a power puncher with a 53% knockout ratio. The computer ranks him at number 33, but he's ranked by the WBA at number six and the IBF at number 12. The WBC and WBO, neither one of them uh, have, uh, have him ranked. His uh, notable wins, his three biggest fights uh, all took place in 2021. He beat Kiko Martinez in a 12-round decision in uh, uh, February of 21. He beat Variel Simon uh, in August of 21 uh, when he stopped him in, in the fourth of a scheduled eight. Simon was 22-6 and six at the time. And uh, he also fought Bruno Taramo uh, uh, in uh, uh, 21, uh, December of 2021, uh, and he uh, won a 12-round decision against him. Um you know, who's going to win this fight? Well, to be honest, I, I think it's a close fight. They're both close in age. They're both the same size. Uh, they both have similar amount of professional fights. I mean, Barrett has two more fights than him. Uh, they both have two losses. Um, I'm leaning towards Zelfa Barrett in this one. Uh, I just think that uh, uh, Gill, even though he's the younger fighter, I think that the, uh, the power belongs to Barrett. And I just think that Overall, he's fought a little uh, tougher opposition. So I, I, I'm picking uh, Barrett uh, over that um, in that fight. And the other fight is a heavyweight matchup. Um, 
that uh, features uh, Jared Anderson and uh, Riot uh, Murphy. Uh, now, Murphy, look, uh, he's right now he's a heavyweight. Um, the computer has him at number 31. The WBO has him at number 14. He moved into into the heavyweight division from the cruiserweights in 2021. Uh, as a heavyweight, he fought at 229 in his last fight. If you look at his record, most of his fights are against weak opposition. His best win was against Samuel Clarkson in 2018, uh, and he lost uh, his uh, two losses. Uh, one was uh, at the hands of, of uh, uh, Arson uh, Golomarian, uh, where he lost uh, to him in, in 2018. And his other loss was to Kevin Larina, a guy who fought on that big card out of Saudi Arabia, who I thought um, should have gotten a draw uh, in that fight, but just didn't have the energy to just throw one more punch to drop his opponent. But uh, his biggest win, I mentioned, was Samuel Clarkson. And actually, um, his best win of his career took place in uh, December of last year when he beat Tony Yoka, who was a... a you know, high profile fighter. He beat him in a real close 10 round decision uh, on that. Um, he uh, uh, is 31 years old. Um, you know, he's uh, got, he's a knockout puncher, but again, he's a, he's a smaller guy. Now he steps in with Gerard Anderson. Uh, Anderson, uh, he's ranked number 21 by the computer. All four of the major sanctioning bodies have him ranked. The WBC has him at number five. Uh, the WBA has him at number 13. The IBF has him at number five. And the WBO has him at number four. His last three fights were all against good opposition. He fought uh, George Arias uh, in uh, 2023, uh, stopped him in three of a scheduled 10. He fought Big Charles Martin, won a 10 round decision over him in July of last year. And in his last fight, Andre Rudenko, uh, he uh, stopped him in five. Um, you know, this kid is on his way up. He's looking uh, to make a statement here. Um, and uh, I, I believe, you know, fighting uh, and all those wins came in 2023, by the way, those three uh, opponents, 16 and 0 with 15 knockouts, six foot four, uh, high knockout percentage uh, at 90, uh, almost 94 uh, percent, 24 years old. I, th this is this a promising young uh, heavyweight from the U.S. I don't see him having any trouble with Murray. Uh I'm picking uh, Gerard Anderson uh, in that one. So uh, a couple of comments I'll forward from the chat room. Uh, my man Coach uh, is uh, saying that Gill is coming off, coming back uh, after a self-proclaimed uh, drinking problem. And by the way, Coach, I know you popped in a little late, but uh, at the beginning of the show, we gave a shout out to you. And uh, Smith, uh, Travis uh, uh, winning his uh, uh, his uh, competition last week. So uh, make sure you uh, let him listen. Um, and aside from that, listen, enjoy the fights this weekend. I appreciate you guys stopping in and hanging with us. Uh, special thanks to uh, John Iceman Scully uh, for joining us. Uh, it was actually uh, an interview that we were going to have uh, a couple weeks ago, but he ended up on a plane in Vegas and everything else. Great guy. Love seeing John at the fights, uh, and uh, I want to see you at the fights. Next time uh, I'm ringside, uh, make sure you come up and say hello. Uh, we'll be uh, – I'm trying to think the next fights I'm going to be at. I don't even know yet, uh, but I was just up at uh, Mohegan Sun. Had a great time there, Star Boxing's event. And don't forget to visit uh, billycboxing.com. If you're looking for just the news and none of the bullshit, uh, go over to our boxing news uh, section and uh, you'll get just that. All right, boys and girls, make sure you tune in next week. Same bat time, same bat channel right here. Until then, ciao, baby. <laughs>